A lot of the things in sunscreen are downright dangerous. I'm amazed that they're still on the market. We do recommend that people wear sunscreen every single day, year round, including when they are indoors. There really is zero safe dose of UV light. Healthy and tan do not go together. <laughs> it's better to just avoid the sun. There's a reason this feels good on my skin. Do not fear the sun, my friends. Recently, it seems like the sun can't catch a break. But as we spend more and more time indoors and slather on more and more sunscreen, vitamin D deficiency and skin cancer rates continue to trend upward. Clearly, something isn't right here. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the history of sunscreen, the benefits of the sun, why you can't just take a vitamin D pill, the potential dangers of sunscreen, and how you can reap the benefits of the sun responsibly. Let's start our search. 5,000 years ago, in 3100 BC. The ancient Egyptians used a combination of rice bran, jasmine, and lupine to help protect them from the sun's rays. Turns out rice bran absorbs UV radiation, and jasmine can help fix damaged DNA. This was the first known use of sunscreen, 12,000 BC. The ancient Greeks are recorded as having used olive oil on their skin, wearing long, loose-fitting clothing and wearing wide-brim hats to protect themselves from the sun. And in 500 BC, the ancient Indians became the first people in documented history to use zinc as a sunblock. So sun protection isn't new, but it wasn't until 1801 that it was even known that UV rays existed. This set the stage for Milton Blake, who created the first sunblocking cream in the late 1920s who was then followed by Eugene Schuller and Franz Greiter, who made more effective products in 1936 and 1938. From there, sun cream production skyrocketed, while rates of skin cancer began to go up. All the while, vitamin D levels and time outside began to drop. This has continued to the point where we have people wearing sunscreen year round, even indoors, literally terrified of the sun but we evolved in the sun. We are adapted to the sun. Everything on earth is alive because of the sun. We need the sun. I don't see any other animals terrified of going outside. Vitamin D, AKA the sunshine vitamin, has been associated with all sorts of positive outcomes, including positive hormone levels, a stronger immune system. In Indonesia, almost 100%, it was like 98 point something percent of patients that died with COVID-19 were vitamin D deficient. And lower rates of death from any cause. You also need vitamin D to absorb calcium, which is important for strong bones and teeth. This is especially important in older people as falling is the main cause of death above age 65. It is also thought to play a role in mental health as vitamin D is believed to promote serotonin activity, which is a key neurotransmitter. Studies testing whether vitamin D is effective in seasonal affective disorder treatment have produced mixed findings with some results indicating that it is as effective as light therapy, but others detecting no effect, which could suggest that the real sun is actually better than the vitamin D pill as you're getting the vitamin D and the bright light. Vitamin D deficiency and lack of sunlight could suggest why Scandinavian countries have struggled with high rates of mental health problems and suicide in the past. But, but, but Owen, can't I just take a vitamin D pill and avoid the danger of the sun? If I'm taking vitamin D3, I still need to get out into the sun, correct? Absolutely. Okay. There are benefits of the sun that go far beyond vitamin D, but if you are going to take a vitamin D supplement, I would go for vitamin D3 over D2, as it seems to be a more effective form of the vitamin. The sun is the master timekeeper of our internal circadian clock, which dictates when we feel alert and tired, and when to release certain hormones. The single best thing you can do for your sleep, your energy, your mood, your wakefulness, your metabolism is to get natural light in your eyes early in the day. Don't wear sunglasses to do it. it. Takes about 10 minutes or so. Don't try and do it through a window or windshield. It's gonna take far too long. This sets in motion a huge number of different 
neurobiological and, and hormonal cascades that are good for you, reduces stress late at night, offsets cortisol, a million different things really that are good for you. Many people report feeling better on warmer, brighter days. And it's been shown that exposure to UV light leads to the production of a feel-good chemical called beta endorphin. Now, some people have got worried about this and say we need to cure these naughty tanners of their addiction. But maybe nature made us addicted to the sun on purpose. You go out, it feels good, and then after a while it starts to feel uncomfortable and your body tells you to get out. I'm by no means recommending tanning beds and I don't recommend lying in the sun for hours to try and get a tan. The point I'm making is that the fact that some sun exposure feels good suggests that there is benefit. In his 2013 TED talk titled, Could the Sun Be Good for Your Heart? Dermatologist Richard Weller suggests exposing the skin to UV light could lead to the production of nitric oxide, which can help dilate the blood vessels, reduce blood pressure, and therefore the risk of heart disease. So we put patients with these subjects under the UV and their NO levels do go up and their blood pressure goes down. It's enough at a population level to shift the rates of heart disease. I mean, I'm a dermatologist. My day job is saying to people, you've got skin cancer, it's caused by sunlight, don't go in the sun. I actually think a far more important message is that there are benefits as well as risks to sunlight. Since then, multiple papers have been published showing the benefit of UV exposure or nitric oxide production, and that it can in fact lower blood pressure with many of them suggesting the current view of sun exposure is too fearful and the idea of healthy sun exposure may have credit. Now you know the sun can actually have benefits, let's look at some of the risks and how to prevent them. First up, sunburn seems to increase the risk of skin cancer. I don't think there's anyone out here saying that sunburn is a good thing. I understand that going in the sun for long periods of time, burning your skin until it's red and blistered, is not a good idea. Now for the big question, is tanning bad? I kept hearing this again and again and again, you can't have a healthy tan. So I decided to take a look. I looked at all the studies on the NHS, Cancer Research UK and Cancer.org websites and I found some pretty interesting things. All the studies I looked at did either one of two things. They looked at indoor tanning, which has much more intense radiation and different spectrums and types of radiation, or they conflated tanning with sunburns. They would have a title like, sun exposure linked to cancer. But then I scroll down and look at the actual data and the people who are getting the most sun exposure are also getting burnt the most. Now, to be fair, it is quite hard to separate these things. If anyone has found a study just looking at non-burning sun exposure, please send it to me. I would be interested in seeing that. The logic I see being used a lot is UV in excess can cause cancer. Therefore, no UV is safe. There's this concept called hormesis, where a little bit of stress can actually be beneficial for your body. Like the saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. From everything I've read, I think the sun has a J-curve effect. Some is beneficial, but too much is going to cause problems. But it was quite shocking to me that this idea of no such thing as a healthy tan is being pushed by dermatologists and big institutions. But then when I go and look at the research, it doesn't really seem to be what it's saying. What I do think there's good evidence for though, is that sunburn is contributing to cancer and that tanning beds don't really seem to be helping either. To sum it up, it seems to be all based on correlation data that hasn't done a very good job of separating burning and non-burning sun exposure. In fact, some studies actually found that people with a tan actually had lower risk of getting skin cancer as they got that natural protection on their skin. Sure, if you sit inside and never go in the sun, you're not going to get sunburn, which isn't going to contribute to your risk of skin cancer. But I think you're going to be a lot more susceptible to other diseases and be missing out on quite a lot of other benefits that the sun has to offer. Despite the increased knowledge and media coverage of the risks of sun exposure and tanning beds, skin cancer rates continue to climb. Why is this? There appears to be a couple of possible explanations. Firstly, as people are more aware of skin cancer, they might be getting checked more often, so more cancer is actually being detected than before. In the past, these people may have not got checked and would have still had skin cancer, but it just wouldn't have been recorded. 
It has also been suggested that melanoma rates are overreported as the increase in new diagnoses almost perfectly tracks the rise in population skin biopsy rates. So overdiagnosis is likely the predominant explanation for the rise. People may also be thinking they're invincible just because they put sun cream on and are staying out way longer than they should. Another common thing mentioned is, what about the ozone, bro? According to NASA, since 1960s, the ozone today is about 3.5% thinner, which has led to 6% more radiation on average worldwide, which is not good by any means, but that doesn't sound awful. The greatest increases in radiation have happened close to the poles, which would explain why places like Australia have high rates of skin cancer. The ozone across the world is suspected to recover by 2050 and the hole over Antarctica is expected to completely heal by 2065. There is also another slightly controversial possible reason for this explosion in skin cancer rates and that is diet. Have you ever wondered why lime pickers in summer sometimes get these weird burns? No? Well, the answer is furanocumarins, toxins found in certain plants such as citrus fruit. To quote this article from the WHO, furanocumarins are phototoxic. They can cause severe skin reactions under sunlight and while mainly occurring after dermal exposure, such reactions have also been reported after consumption of large quantities of certain vegetables containing high levels of furanocumarins. So this shows that the foods we eat can have an effect on how susceptible we are to burning. But furanocumarins are not what I want to focus on. First we need to understand how the sun can damage your skin. Overexposure to UV light damages your cells and causes inflammation and DNA damage. A sunburn is basically your cells committing suicide so they don't become cancerous. Okay, so we went from zero in 1865 to 80 grams a day. Now let me just say, this is an infinite increase in vegetable oil consumption. That makes this the single greatest change to nutrition in all of history. I don't think anything else can even begin to compare. Vegetable seed oils are packed with polyunsaturated fat. Due to their chemical structure, they are prone to oxidation or breaking down. We do need some of these fats, but due to processing, we're getting much more than we ever could historically. When you eat these fats, they're incorporated into the membranes of essentially all cells in the body. It's been shown in humans that lipid peroxidation process where fats break down can be caused by UV light. Lipid peroxidation then goes on to cause toxic breakdown products which go on to cause more damage. Do you see where I'm going with this? So if you're eating lots of these oils which are highly present in the western diet, these fragile fats are being built into all your cells. You go out into the sun and the UVB radiation breaks down these fats causing lipid peroxidation and causing you to sunburn. At least, that's the mechanism that a lot of people have put forward. And it's interesting to note that there have been many, many people who have cut these oils out of their diet and say it takes them a lot longer to sunburn. They're not invincible, but the time it takes to burn is longer. It's also been shown that applying linoleic acid, the main fat found in these oils, to damage skin and then shining UV on that area of skin causes inflammation. Whereas when cholesterol was applied, a much more stable molecule, it actually protected against the UV radiation. Polyunsaturated fat intake, particularly the omega-6s found in vegetable oils, have been modestly correlated with skin cancer and patients with melanoma have been found to have higher linoleic acid in their tissues. In 1996, Israel had one of the highest consumption of these fats and in the past has also had very high rates of skin cancer. I haven't been able to find any more recent data on how much they're consuming now and their current skin cancer rates. And this is just one example. So let's move on. To be fair, we need more studies here. 
The logic makes sense, but we need to test it more in a controlled setting. But I do think it makes a decent case that this could be a contributing factor. This isn't to say that UV isn't causing cancer, it's just too many of these fats could be throwing fuel on the fire. There's also evidence that eating a diet high in antioxidants can help combat skin damage, but the results have been mixed. Milton Blake, who launched the first chemical sunscreen in 1932, use ingredients that aren't really used anymore. Fast forward to the 1980s, ingredients such as oxybenzone and octanoxate were added. These are still used today and seem like a great idea. These ingredients have been shown to absorb UV radiation. However, there might be some issues with some of these compounds. Hawaii is considering a statewide ban that could affect the way you pack for vacation. In 2018, Hawaii became the first US state to ban sunscreens containing two compounds, oxybenzone and octinoxate, as they are thought to damage coral reefs. They do seem to cause problems in a lab, but in most of the sea, the concentration is just way too low to be having any effect. However, in certain bays and areas where the geology is different, the water is trapped and the concentrations become much higher, and it appears in these areas it could be having an effect. However, many people view this ban as a bit of a scapegoat for bigger problems such as oil spills and climate change. Some chemicals in sunscreen have been shown to cause problems in sea urchins, zooplankton, fish, other marine life, and rats. These include decreased testosterone and sperm, enlarged kidneys and liver, and change to the menstrual cycle. However, some of these studies have been criticized for using dosages that are too high. You might say, that's cool and all, but I'm a human, not a rat. And that's a fair point. Before we move on, can I ask you a personal question? Would you be willing to eat sun cream? I guess your answer is no. Well, how would you feel if I told you oxybenzone was found in 96.8% of Americans' urine in a recent study, suggesting it's gone around the entire body? Now, let's not get too worried, let's look at the human data. In humans, high levels of oxybenzone have been correlated with early births and giving birth to children with Hirschsprung's disease, where muscles are unable to move stools through the intestines, which can be life-threatening. It's also been associated with decreased thyroid hormone, testosterone level, kidney function, and delayed puberty. Currently, these are all correlations and more studies are being carried out to see if these compounds are causing these problems and if they are in what dosages. The FDA has said that these chemicals are allowed to be absorbed into the skin at levels of 0.5 nanograms per milliliter or less without rigorous safety testing. However, if this level was exceeded, extra safety testing must be carried out. This study in 2020 looked at six common chemicals used in sunscreens and found that all of them were absorbed above that level and stayed elevated for days afterwards. For oxybenzone, the maximum concentration reached was 258.1 nanograms per milliliter, over 500 times higher than the level that the FDA set. In 2019, the FDA updated their sunscreen regulations and stated for many common chemical ingredients in sunscreen, such as homosalate, octinoxate, octisalate, octocrylene, oxybenzone, and avabenzone. We do not have sufficient data that these compounds can be generally recognized as safe and effective. Now, this doesn't mean that these chemicals are necessarily unsafe, it's just that we don't know. But if the current human and animal data is anything to go off, you won't catch me running off to slather myself in chemical sunscreen. Remember the potential link we talked about earlier between seed oils and skin irritation? Well, it turns out many sunscreens use these oils as a base ingredient. It only has five ingredients. Organic sunflower oil. So that might be something you want to watch out for in sun cream ingredients, as well as your diet. Oils from seeds such as rapeseed, sunflower, cottonseed, and soybean. In fact, only two ingredients, zinc oxide and titanium dioxide, in concentrations up to 25%, would be generally recognized as safe and effective by the FDA. The perhaps harmful ingredients that we've talked about so far are found in chemical sunscreens. Sunscreens that absorb UV radiation and go into your body like a sponge. Whereas these two substances are in what's called physical sunscreens, where they sit on the top of your skin and reflect and absorb the UV radiation. 
However, some are worried about nanoparticle versions of these compounds, as in some animal studies they've been able to get through the skin, cross the blood-brain barrier, and accumulate in the brain. However, it's not entirely clear that these nanoparticles can get through human skin. Based off of animal inhalation studies, titanium dioxide nanoparticles were classified as possible carcinogenic to humans by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. So you may want to avoid sunscreens that contain nano versions of these compounds. Even with non-nano titanium dioxide and zinc oxide, inhalation may still cause problems. So it'd be best to go for creams and lotions rather than sprays and powders. Okay, so we went through a lot, but what can you take away from this to stay safe and reap the benefits of the sun responsibly? Soon after you wake up, go outside and get some light on your face and your skin. This will help set your circadian clock and make you feel awake. It will also help you falling asleep later at night. Don't wear sunglasses to do it. It takes about 10 minutes or so. Don't try and do it through a window or a windshield. It's gonna take far too long. It turns out clothing is actually the best protection against UV light, closely followed by zinc oxide. In summer, I slowly expose myself to more sun over time and stay in touch with my body. If my skin starts to feel uncomfortable, I cover up and seek shade. From what I've read, I haven't found anything convincing that having a tan is bad, but I'm not telling you to do this, this is just what I do. I would go and check the studies yourself, I'll leave links below. Don't blame me if you get skin cancer, but from what I've read, getting burned is definitely bad, so don't do that. If I find myself in a situation where there's more sun than usual and I haven't been able to adapt, and the only thing available is chemical sunscreen, I probably will use it. The potential risks from that sun cream probably going to be less than the risks from getting burned. That's the thing with this, the dose makes the poison, so if you're using this once in a while it's probably going to have a negligible effect if any at all. People make the argument that there isn't enough evidence to say that chemical sunscreens are bad and that we should avoid them and that's fine, if you want to use them go for it I don't mind. But personally with the much higher absorption rates, the FDA unable to say they're safe and effective and the data we do have from animals and humans you won't see me rushing to put this on. I think the endocrine disruption stuff is interesting, and I think this could be one of the reasons why male testosterone and sperm counts are down so much in the last century. There are also microplastics, parabens, phthalates, and other things, some of which are in sunscreen, which could be contributing to this, but I decided to save that for another video. The best sunscreens to use seem to be non-nano zinc oxide, followed by titanium dioxide, preferably not in a powder or spray form. Many natural sunscreens contain natural fats such as tallow, olive oil and coconut oil. These are low in linoleic acid, contain antioxidants and give some sun protection, though not much. I'd also watch out for vegetable oils in your sun cream, as well as your diet. Using a chemical sunscreen now and then probably isn't going to do you any real damage. I want the main takeaway from this video to be that some of these chemicals maybe aren't as safe as we thought and that you shouldn't be scared of the sun. If you want to know more about the dangers of vegetable oils, check out these videos. And if you don't care, then don't watch them. Have a good day. A journey that may go back to the very origins of what made us human in the first place. Human in the first place. Human in the first place.